Hi, I'm Tina DeBelgarn. I'm the secretary of the Mavens of Mayhem. That's the Upper Hudson Valley chapter of Sisters in Crime. It is my pleasure to announce uh, and to introduce our guest of honor, Sujata Massey. She'll be doing a wonderful masterclass for us today. Sujata is the author of 15 novels that relate to the mystery and history of India and Japan. Her writing journey began when she left her reporting job at the Baltimore Evening Sun newspaper to live in Hayama, Japan, where she taught English and studied Japanese. Later, she returned with her husband to Baltimore and turned her experiences into the Rei Shimura mystery series, 11 novels, some of which won the Agatha and McAvity Awards and were shortlisted for the Edgar, Anthony, and other awards. Since 2018, she's written the Pervine Mystery Histor Historical Series set in 1921 Bombay. The series numbers three books, the first of which, The Widows of Malabar Hill, won the Mary Higgins Clark Prize and the Lefty, Agatha, and McCavity Mystery Fiction Awards. Her books are published in 19 countries and have been optioned for television. The newest book in the Pervine series is titled The Bombay Prince and will be published in June. We're very, very lucky to have her here with us today and participate, we'll be participating in her masterclass, which is a journalistic approach to writing a novel, how to add the right details without becoming an encyclopedia. I'm looking forward to this, Sujata. Thank you so much, Tina. And your Japanese pronunciation is amazing. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> you made my day. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you have experience. Um, so I'm hoping to um, talk to you and show you some pictures of my travels in India and Japan as we're talking. So I'm going to run a PowerPoint. And um, I guess at this point, I'm just going to hit my PowerPoint because I think I have share screen ability and see what happens. Yeah, so Jada, go ahead and go down to the bottom for share screen and choose the PowerPoint that you want to go and it should okay. work just fine. Oh, do you see it? No, you have to go oh, okay. to the okay. bottom so of the room. Get, and hit. Get out. I didn't hit the share screen. That's my right. fault. I didn't follow directions. Okay, so now I'm going to, um, oh, what am I going to share? I don't understand what, it, share desktop one, I guess. Uh, share whichever one you have open. If your thing's open, no, that, that's your desktop. Go ahead and stop sharing. And if you have the PowerPoint open already, well, you could do it that way too. That will work. Go ahead. Okay, okay. Are you seeing? Go. I'm screen sharing. Okay. Can you hear me? If somebody can give me an inclination that you can hear me, I don't know if you can do that. I can hear you just fine. And if you want to go up to slideshow menu and hit start slideshow, it'll go yeah. big I, as well. I'm going to hit the. Um, Show. Yep. Okay. Here we go. Okay. I'm ready to roll now. So um, this is the, the topic you've heard it already. And I wanted to add that I've actually been a Sisters in Crime member since 1996. I, or maybe even earlier, I think probably 90, 93 or 94 when I was trying to write my first book. So this is the first time I've ever taught a master class for Sisters in Crime. It's a tremendous honor for me. And this is something that I was involved in, you know, when I was starting out, this was really, really key for me, any type of chapter meeting. Of course, we didn't even have Zoom then. Zoom was just a twinkle in your eye at that point. Um, and so what I wanna do today is talk to you about how I use my experience as a former journalist in the work I do with my mysteries that are historical and set overseas. And I think even if you're not writing something that's historical or set outside of your state, there's some techniques in here that might be helpful for you. So I'm the author of two series and they're set in two different countries and two different eras. And, um, I'm one of those writers that doesn't sit in the chair eight hours a day like people like the great Anne Perry. I'm more of that person that's there for a short time but is always thinking about how to get out and get the information I need or always off at the library. That's the way that I like to work. I personally think that research is the most fun part of any, any writing, any book creation experience. 
And my hope is to make research a little bit more enjoyable and also that you come away with something to keep that you can use. And the fact is when we do books that are really carefully researched and that actually have facts, we enrich the mystery genre. We bring a, a lot of honor to it. We, we convert people who say, oh, I never read mystery. I'm a serious reader. You know, we're able to appeal to so many more people when we can add a little something extra to our mysteries. So I guess I've been a writer since a very young age. Um, this is a picture of me in third grade. And um, I, I learned to read, you know, in kindergarten, it was really early. I mean, a lot of people learned to read in kindergarten, but I was like reading, you know, substantially excited and able to progress quickly. And I had an unhappy childhood. And I don't know if this is a, um, a little, you know, like, oh, you're gonna be a good writer because you had an unhappy childhood. But I had an unhappy childhood because um, I was born in one country. I was born in Britain. My, my dad is Indian, my mom is German. We moved to the United States when I was a young child. And initially we were in areas that were, um, you know, it was pretty easy going. You know, we were in Pennsylvania for a while. We were in California for a while, but most of my life was in the Midwest and, you know, to be, to have a foreign name, to have a brown skin and not to be identified as a Christian person like that made it a really difficult childhood. And thank goodness I already had my books and I was reading Little House on the Prairie and saying, well, this, this Minnesota is nice. This is the Minnesota I want to live in. And so I, I, that's pr probably when I started to fall in love with historical fiction. And I read a lot of historical children's fiction. I read a lot of mysteries. Um, you know, I'm very happy, well-adjusted person now. So I, I think that the, those hardships of my childhood drove me a little bit further into books. And ultimately that was a good thing for me. So I left the Midwest where I mentioned that I had a, a pretty hard childhood. Um, when I was 18 to go to college in Baltimore, Maryland. And I went to two schools here. I first, I went to Goucher, but I wound up graduating from Johns Hopkins University, which had a really um, intense creative writing program. It's called the Writing Seminars. And there is a graduate school, which sort of which turns out, you know, master's degree people who spend one year there. But as an undergraduate, you have all the same professors that were in that graduate program and you can be doing it for years. You can be doing these, th these writing seminars, which are just the small workshop type classes for years. And you can go through college with hardly taking an exam that all you have to do is, is write stories, write articles, um, write poems. You know, to me, this was like a dream degree. And there were some incredible professors in it. We had as a visiting um, faculty, we had Martha Grimes. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I heard that. And so can you imagine? And she gave us each a signed copy of her latest New York Times bestseller. And I, I mean, I was flabbergasted. And for me to see a real mystery writer who was extremely successful and extremely generous, that made a good, that made a good impression on me about the genre. Though I had no intention of becoming a fiction writer when I left college. I saw what the future was and the future was, you know, graduate school and having a story in a little magazine. And that's not what I wanted. I, I wanted more of what Martha Grimes had, but I knew at 22 years old, I didn't really have the chops to do it. Plus I loved journalism. I had been on the college paper and I got an internship at the Baltimore Evening Sun. Um, in those days, the 1980s into the early 90s, there were two newspapers published by the same company, The Morning Sun and The Evening Sun. And I worked at The Evening Sun. Laura Lippman, who you may know, Dan Vesperman um, were also at The Evening Sun, though Laura eventually went to The Morning Sun. David Simon was on The Morning Sun. Um, Stephen Hunter, was, uh, who writes thrillers, was on The Morning Sun. So it was a very creative pool of people. And I was so fortunate to get that job out of college. And I'm saying, I'm showing you the kind of things that I wrote about. I worked on the cops desk, which meant I was reporting 
crimes, um, though not actually shoe leather, you know, more of talking to the police officers. I did a lot of food writing, fashion, features on all kinds of people. Um, and I learned these really big lessons. You know, people realize, look, this kid is just out of school. She hasn't even been to journalism school. She was in the airy fairy writing seminars, you know, where she was writing poems and opinion pieces. So they, they shared a lot with me. And one of the most important things that I learned right away was that I had to be objective. I couldn't put my opinion into things. And I got in trouble a few times and I learned, um, you know, some of the things I got in trouble for were I was assigned to do a review of a dinner theater show. And I went into it with like, oh, dinner theater is so lame. This is going to be so corny. And I wrote, it's so lame and it's so corny. Now, the, the dinner theater, people love dinner theater for what it is. It's like you have to look, you have to look. I didn't look at it as a play. I looked at it with my preconception. Another lesson that comes to mind was I was out reporting it, you know, at an event, say at the Baltimore Inner Harbor, and I was talking to people on the street. That's what reporters do a lot of. And you try so hard, you take down their age, you take down their name, you um, write down the words they said, you might ask them back, is that what you said? And so I remember that there was a, a woman who had said something and she, I got her age was 31, and she had mentioned that she was a grandmother. And so when I was writing my story, my editor said, um, well, I wrote, she's a 31 year old grandmother. And he said, hey, you know what? You, you're doing that, that's snarky. They didn't say snarky then, but he, he had a word for it. Um, so I was starting to learn that even though I had this experience as being a marginalized Asian person, almost my whole life in Minnesota, I had the power to do that to other people without realizing it. And so that was a little bit of a, an awakening. And I think a very important lesson that I took away from journalism. So I worked at the paper for five years. I loved it. I never would have left except I fell in love and um, I got married and my husband had a debt of service to the US Navy. So we moved to Japan, which I was thrilled about um, because I thought if I have to leave my job at a newspaper where I, you know, I, I love my work, at least I could, if I go somewhere foreign, maybe I can write about that place. And when I got there, I discovered that the life of a freelance reporter was way, 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 way more work for bucks. Um, and I thought, you know, let me try and do some different things. So I started studying Japanese. You see me here studying cooking. Um, and that's the, the person in the middle, Emiko-san was the teacher. And she was this wonderful woman in her 60s who'd been cooking all her life. And it was a class of um, American, American women. And she, you know, we, I learned all kinds of things there. Um, one of the things I think we might have been making miso that day. And one of the things that, that I loved about the cooking class is I would write everything down and draw pictures. And I remember her taking the miso, which is pounded soybean paste, and she put it in a little um, secret little box, like she lifted out a tile on her kitchen floor and there was this space underneath. And that's something that's in every Japanese kitchen. It's called the yukashita. And it's a place where you kind of cold store foods to ferment them. And I use that later. <laughs> so um, military life, I wanna talk to you that the other part of my awakening and sort of how I came to learn about Japan and the things that I needed for my books were um, as a military spouse. And one of the things I did was volunteer as an English teacher to the Japanese military. You may realize that notice that most of the people in that picture are Japanese. The man sitting directly next to me at the coffee table is my husband. And I was receiving a diploma and a vase as thanks for two years service. And one of the things that was so great about this job um, was I 
had the experience of being a, a part of the Japanese economy because like all these other people were paid and I wasn't paid, I didn't care, but I got to sit in the employee lounge with them. I got to have conversations with them. And these men started to open up to me. Like I was um, learning about how it was, to, how hard it was to work in a hierarchical society and be expected to do things that you didn't want to do. Like a lot of these men had to work very late hours. They were for, they were forced to drink alcohol. They secretly poured their drinks into potted plants um, because they didn't want to be under the influence of alcohol. Like these are incredible details that I was stealth learning. Um, and I also shared with some of these teachers, not every single person, but you know the people that I was becoming close to, that I was interested in writing about Japan. I thought I might write a novel and there were some things I needed to know more about. And they said, ask me any questions, Sujata-san. And while I was in Japan, um, my reading material was limited. You know, writers always need to be reading, right? And the base library was full of Westerns and you know, they might have had the only novels by women were like Phyllis Whitney romances from a long time ago. And then they did have the Sue Grafton uh, mysteries. But so I went to the foreign bookstore, um, you know, the bookstore, which had a um, foreign section. And I found this incredible travel memoir called Video Night in Kathmandu that I still treasure this book so much. And Pico Iyer is a, um, you know, Genetically, he's Indian. He's grown up all over the world. And for decades, he's lived in Asia. Um, he's just one of those people that lives in chronicles. And he's, he's a brilliant writer. And he, he has a gift with this book that he um, goes into a scene and he is able to not focus on like, oh, I'm going to Kyoto and I just want to see the old temples. He'll say, I went to Kyoto and on the way to the temple, somebody was bicycling along with a t-shirt that had a really wacky slogan. So you really get the feeling of what the modern day country is like. And here's an, here's an excerpt that I thought was, he's got just tons and tons, but I love this excerpt where he's talking about um, something that he saw in Thailand. And he said, the, part of it, he says, the bar girls were clad in Lee jeans and Kmart tops. The songs in the jukebox were American and were so were the shows on the video. On any given day, the flash dancers of Bangkok could saunter from the Travolta boutique to the Patty Duke barbershop, then move on to the Manhattan high tech store to the Club Manhattan Hotel or the Florida, or the Atlanta, the, Re the Reno, the Niagara, the Imperial, or the M Miami. So you get the point that like, I, I completely buy in that Pico Iyer is being honest about all this. You know, he was a decorated journalist and Condé Nast traveler, and that's how they found him. And, you know, the, the vintage publishing said, please write a book for us. Um, but the details that he includes they make me smile. They make me want to go to Thailand. And I think that when I get there, I'll, I'll have some feeling of recognition. And I thought, I'm living in Japan and I see the craziest slogans everywhere. I see, I rode the, I rode the train to Tokyo today. I, this, this really happened. I see a beautiful woman in her forties wearing a full kimono, sandals with a heel like this, wick. She's clearly on her way to the temple, the tea ceremony or a restaurant job. And she's reading a comic book. So those were the things that I wanted to share in my novel. So ethnocentrism, something that Pico Iyer does very well is he announces he's a visitor. He announces it right away. And a lot of times in books that have been written about other places, you see a lot of stereotypes. Like, so that writing that I'm talking about, it's not 
stereotypes. It's saying, these are things I see, but they're not stereotypes. And so I have a definition of, of ethnocentrism, um, evaluations of other cultures according to preconceptions originating in the standard and customs of one's own culture. Basically, all the literature that you read, that you've read about India that was published prior to 1947 was written by British people who did exactly this. And there are things in physical descriptors, there th there's the use of language, there are all these stereotypes. And so for somebody like me that comes from an Asian background that wants to be, I want to treat people the way I'd want people to treat me. How am I gonna come into this world and write, do this writing? And I think that for people working in the United States who are writing about multiple cultures, it's the same thing. And what I always say, you know, this is like my tip coming into the talk is that writers groups can be really helpful multicultural associations. Like for example, I was always a member of the Japan America Society when I came back to the United States, wherever I lived and I continued writing my Japanese series, I was always part of these groups. So that, and I was, I would join play groups where I not just be, I joined an international play group because it was a wonderful play group, but the benefit, but a side benefit was there were a lot of moms from other co countries. So I got to spend time with these moms and their babies and my child. And I learned a lot and I, I got a lot of, I could run ideas by them. Does this make sense? Am I old fashioned? There are all kinds of ways that we can link to other people to learn more. So out of that time in Japan, I got 11 books, hopefully 11 books are up there. Um, and the first, the, the central character, I, I chose to make her an American woman because the way that I would see and react to something is probably different from someone who grew up in Japan. Some of the things we, we might react the same way. We probably both react in horror to a murder. Um, but if someone says something to us, I might be offended about by it and she might not be offended by it. So I made my character of American descent with a Japanese dad and an American mother. And so that way she has, a, she's looking like the culture, but she isn't exactly sounding like the culture. She wants to belong to the culture. She wants to be embraced, um, but it doesn't always go her way. And she has wonderful relatives in Japan so she can be in that Japanese environment. And those relatives she had are, very similar to good friends of mine in Yokohama who hosted me for many, many times. It's my flower arranging teacher's family. And so her aunt is a flower arranging teacher as a tribute. Um, so that, so I had these mysteries. They're all about the Japanese cultural arts because as you remember, I like that stuff. Um, I really enjoyed um, flower arranging. I really enjoyed cooking. I love the history of Japanese fashion and textiles. There's the book Bride's Kimono. Um, as time went on though, I was more grounded in the United States than in Japan. And that was starting, little warning bells were starting for me because what really made books like, you know, The Salary Man's Wife, this first one, such a big hit was because I knew what's the t-shirt of the year that everybody's wearing. Um, you know, I was just on it because I was right there and I wasn't on it anymore. So I would take a lot, I would take as long a trip as I could, but with two little kids, that was getting harder. So some of the later Ray books deal with Japanese themes, but they're set in places that it was easier for me to travel to. Like the Samurai's Daughter was set in San Francisco. My sister lived in San Francisco. So in order to research that trip, I made a trip to San Francisco with my toddler and my mother. And we, so we, I did the research that way. And um, the book, um, the, the Girl in a Box is about a Japanese restaurant, a very artful, trendy Japanese restaurant in Washington, DC. That was only an hour's drive for me. So I could easily go and do that work. And it was important to me to walk those streets 
to use real street names, to throw in a real hotel, to throw in a real metro station. You know, that's what I was doing in Japan and I wanted to do that in the United States. So at this point, we're, we're at um, slide 11. I have question time. I can't, I, I'm gonna keep my PowerPoint up. Um, I could, I wonder if I can look in the chat for, I don't know that I can see questions in the chat. Is it possible for people to, ask me questions now, like maybe turn on their microphone. Hi, Sujata, we have all the microphones turned off, but people can put it in the chat. And if you can't see the chat, I'm happy to read them out to you as well, so. Yeah, that would be great. So let's just take like five minutes for, for questions at this point. If anyone has any questions, type away, please. <laughs> It's been really interesting, Sujata. I just haven't seen any questions come up in the chat yet. Here's one. Uh, Brea asked, do, do, you base, uh, do you base your characters on real people for authenticity? And Tina says, are your Japanese characters based on real people and how do you handle that? Okay, that's a really good question because, um, I, th but my, my short answer is no, they're not based on real people. Though I did tell you that the, um, aunt was inspired. I made her a flower arranging teacher because I, my dear friend who was a flower arranging teacher. So I like, there might be a trait. So there's a very sexy Scottish gentleman in the, um, these Ray Shimura books that she's, he, his name is Hugh Glendening and he's a boyfriend who, you know, is in a number of the books. He's probably the favorite boyfriend of the whole series. And she has three boyfriends in the series. His last name, Glenn Denning, uh, came to me when I was in a, in a, my husband and I were in a bar in Tokyo and we met some really nice guys. And one of them had a Scottish background and his name was Glenn Denning. And I said, oh, I just love that name. I'd like to use that in my book and he said oh yes please go and use it so he gets to be <laughs> this really sexy character you know the first name is different um so i i do i i wouldn't do that because of people getting upset like a lot of books there's something in the beginning which says this book there's any resemblance to characters real people is um here it is. This is a work of fiction. The characters, incidents, and dialogues are products of the author's imagination, not to be construed as real. Any resemblance to actual events or persons, living or dead, is coincidental. So the the second part, because this really is a this is such a great question, and I'm so glad that we have this question from Bria. Now I write. We're, we, this is the Ray, we're, we did, I told you a little bit about the Ray for the first half of my talk. Now that I, the, what happened is I moved on to start writing books that are set in India in the 1920s. There are real people in this book. They are people like Mahatma Gandhi. Um, who else was there? There's a, there's a, Muhammad Ali Jinnah is mentioned. Um, Madame Bikaji Kama. These are all people in the freedom movement and political activism. So what I do with them is I might say she went and she went to his, she went to the court hearing for Mohandas Gandhi when he was tried for sedition and she, she was with this group of lawyers or he spoke to her kindly about something. But I, I never do an actual dialogue. And this is, you know, I'm published in India also, right? So anybody, I mean, they could, they could just like sue, they could absolutely sue the publisher and say that I showed disrespect to Gandhi. They could say he never was there. It, it would be a nightmare. So I'm very, they're kind of like these shadow figures. I think it's important that people know they were active in the story. Um, you know, for example, the the book that I'm writing, well, actually not writing, this one, The Bombay Prince, which is coming out in June, what happened in November 1921 is 
Mohandas Gandhi called for people to boycott the arrival of the Prince of Wales in India. He was coming, the Prince of Wales was coming on a tour and um, Mahatma Gandhi said, don't go. Don't just, don't just, just peacefully don't go. And, and that's gonna let the British know that you don't want a continuation of British rule. So that event is described. And then there was a huge riot afterwards that lasted more than three days. And Gandhi had to hunger strike in order to get people to stop because he asked people to stop rioting and they wouldn't stop rioting. So that's a real event. I put it in, but I don't have her looking at his emaciated form or anything like that. I don't have a discussion. I don't want to, I'm, I'm totally sticking to the facts on that. So that's sort of like my double barreled approach on facts and uh, real people. Is there another question yes. in the chat? So Jada, we have a couple questions. The next okay. one is from Diane Scott, uh, who asks, do you recommend sensitivity readers if writing a secondary character not of the same culture as you? Um, I possibly, and I think that if you do, you should pay the sensitivity reader. Um, unless the sensitivity reader is like a person in your family. Like for example, if your in-laws are of the background of the people that you're writing about, they might not say, you know, it might not be a big deal for them. Um, the question is, you've got to think, will they think I'm talking about them? So there's, there's all kind of layers to it. So I'm not against that idea at all. Um, I think that your sensitivity reader should ideally, you know, be, be comfortable with literature and kind of understanding um, licenses that people take, but also be able to um, say, you know, this this is a hurtful thing. Um, you know, it it there there are definitely situations where it's important. Like, so what I do about sensitivity reading is, while I have an Indian heritage, I did not grow up in all the religious traditions that I write about. So I write about um, Muslim widows in the widows of Malabar Hill. And there's a lot of conceptions about um, women not having a voice or being illiterate or, you know, this or that. And um, I had to think about, I wanna really make sure that I write about seclusion, like living in a secluded part of the house unable to see men in a fair way. Now, the, the fact is it's 2021. Most people have not lived like that since the 1950s. Um, maybe some royalty, were, were some royal older ladies might have lived in seclusion into the 1970s. I know that for sure on their choice, um, but a lot of people haven't. So the, what I, I did is I, when I was in Mumbai, I, I asked, I found a way to meet with a retired woman professor from the University of, of Mumbai, who is a Muslim. And I learned a lot from her, though, of course, this old, old experience, I didn't, I couldn't get that from her, you know, obviously, she's a woman walking around making, you know, making money and teaching and uh, no, she didn't have that. So the, the way I got that kind of information was by reading old novels that were written by women, Muslim women who had grown up in the culture. And these novels were originally written in Urdu. And they were, a few of them are in translation. And when I read those kinds of novels, I got a feeling for what was going on, what it was. And it's not like I would copy the novel, but it was like, I would understand that, oh, there are situations in Porta where you can, you can see, you can see the husband or you could see your brother or your grandfather, but you wouldn't see these other people or it's a floating thing, you know, and I talked to somebody else and I learned about how you could be in Porta when you were in your own state. But if you took a train to Bombay, you could go to a party and dance. So, um, you know, I knew there was a variety of things. So that, that all I learned from talking to people, my quote unquote sensitivity readers. Yeah, any other questions? 
Uh, yes, we have a question from Lorraine Nelson who asks, what was the response of Japanese readers to your series considering you're not Japanese? Well, um, a few of the books came out in Japanese and so not a whole lot of them. And what the, the number one thing people said is, I didn't know you knew that, or I didn't know people knew that about us or, you know, so, so that was I, that they, that was kind of like approving, I think. But um, one, I did get a, I did, I, I had an overall very positive review in the Japan Times, except for one thing, when I said in the book, The Salary Man's Wife, Japanese kitchens are dirty. Can you believe I said that? That's how easy it is to be an ethnocentric person. Um, because I, you know, I came from the United States where that goal is that all white kitchen. Now in a Japanese house, the kitchen is where the woman is doing all the work. It's her zone. It's not a high value zone. They don't give her a lot of storage space. She has to do this, that, and the other, and, you know, present a 10, a 10 course meal at dinner or 10 dish dinner. And where is everything going to go? So it, it's sort of like, if I had said something like the kitchen was top to bottom packed with all these things and you, there was the steam in the air and um, there, there was no dishwasher. You know, if I had done all that, the, you would have had a better picture of the kitchen and I wouldn't have made that faux pas. Uh, so Donna, we also have a question from Frankie Bailey. Do you uh, make use of old newspapers in your research? Oh boy, do I ever. Um, <laughs> so when I, one of the things that's frustrating to me is I can get a book that's like the history of women's rights in India, for example, or I can about the history of political movement, but it doesn't tell you all the little stuff. So newspapers are great, especially because you can get into advertisements. And so you can, you get the names of products that your, your people can use. Remember how I told you I like to know about what the t-shirt slogan is. And I wanna give you a real Japanese t-shirt slogan, not one that I made up. So I was really interested that they just loved Yardley soap in you know colonial India. A lot of people had Yardley soap. I was interested in what was the brand of cigarette that people smoked. I wanted to know what movie was out. So some of the places that I found these newspapers were a reading room in um, in Calcutta. It was it's like a separate library room. I mean, it was incredible. It was this freestanding old colonial office, and unfortunately, there was no air conditioning, and the air was it was open air all day. So these newspapers were crumbling, but I was able to get into them, and I found some really interesting um, letters to the editor, so I could understand how people felt about um, the British government, including when British people started to get upset about the, what the government was doing. Um, I saw articles by Indian women. So I, I found a whole lot of things that you wouldn't find in history books. So in order, a lot of times if you are going to another country to use a library system, there's an elaborate thing where you apply online or you make sure you have all the right documents. And I couldn't even get my card going in to the, the main library to get to the special library because I don't think the person liked me. I mean, I think that they, they saw me as an outsider. So one of the great things that happened is I, I went in with my aunt and my um, cousin and she's a former teacher and boy, she told him where to put it in very polite terms. And I had a library card in like 15 minutes. <laughs> and then one more question's on the chat right now. And that's from Laura Kuhlman who says, I chose to place my crime scenes in fictional streets and buildings, although the rest of the city is accurate. I was afraid that the University of British Columbia would come after me if I commit a crime in a real building. Can I still get in trouble if I mention a real campus, but the street doesn't exist? I don't think you could. I, I really don't think you could. Um, I had the situation of, um, well, you know, the problem is though, you're using a real university. So what I'd be concerned about is the, the character who winds up being the killer. 
because if anybody thinks that that could have been them, you know, you might just get some kind of like a, you could potentially get a nuisance lawsuit. So I, I'm interested that you're writing an academic mystery. I love academic mysteries. Um, I have a I have a death occurring at a college in Mumbai here, and it's it really exists. I went to the college, I did the research, and in the very and for a long time I was writing with the whole college's name, but then at the end, at the last minute, I said, you know, I'm not. I'm going to change it to a different college name, um, just because of that issue, because the. The perpetrators, you know, I don't want to give away too much, but the perpetrators could say, hey, my, or, or it's a long time ago, but somebody could say, you're, in, you're insinuating that my great, great, great grandma did this or that. So I changed the, I changed the college's name. So that was a, that was a choice I made. I think having the different street names and the different buildings is fine. I think you could keep the same ones. I would just, I would be concerned more about the person and like whether a person could read themselves into the scene. Laura says that the killer is not in the university, but is an outsider. And Tina points out that this is sort of the Oxbridge approach where you get the two colleges put together and we all know it's something like that. Yeah, I would agree. And what my friend Laura Lippman has said something funny about it. She said uh, regarding the restaurants in her books, if it's a good restaurant in Baltimore, it's named in the book and it's real. But if it's a bad restaurant, she doesn't, she makes up the name. Those are all the questions that okay, are- Okay, good, okay, yeah. great. Well, we're on, we're on track, we're really, we're tracking nicely. So we'll go on to the new series, new country. Um, so this is a, actually in the picture, this may look interesting to you, it's a Catholic, memorial site it's in a neighborhood called bandra um in in mumbai and there are a lot of catholics there are a lot of indian catholics um and this is my joke rest in peace ray shimura um so i wound up making this shift from writing i'd written 10 books about ray shimura nine of them from the same publisher, large publisher, one for a smaller publisher. And I didn't really enjoy the, that experience with the, the new publisher. And fortunately I had only done a one book contract with them because I wanted to see how I liked it. And I thought, you know, I, I feel like doing something different. Like I've been saying it's, it's, it's hard to keep going there. I'd like to write books that are in foreign settings, but you know, my life is just much more Indian now. Now that I'm ra raising kids, and I had also moved back to the Midwest um, that with my spouse and my kids for six years, I moved back to the place where I was so miserable. Um, I had a better time there as an adult. I didn't have to go to the same, you know, school system, which was good. And so I decided that I was going to try to do like a book of my heart and really the books that I enjoyed reading when I wasn't reading mysteries were things like the books by Lisa C and Amy Tan. I like these big sweeping historical things. So I wanted to try something new and that's what I did in Minnesota. And the first thing I did was, you know, I, I had to start all over a, a journalistic approach um, to India because you know, that what am I going to do? It's, it's, it's a whole new world. I'm sitting in Minnesota. How am I going to do it? So first I started um, at the University of Minnesota. I took advantage of being able to study Hindi there because I had, I had not grown up with Indian languages. I knew food, I knew food language. I knew you could tell me any dish and I could tell you what it is in Hindi or Bengali, but I couldn't get past the food. So I had to learn a little bit more um, and then also th that university has the most incredible library, perhaps in the United States, of collected historical documents and books about India. They had received this gigantic gift from a benefactor in the 1940s, and from there they had continued to build. So um, I did this intensive research, also parenting, so it was like a good life work balance. It was really fun going 
to college every day after my kids had gone to school. Then I would go to college. Then I would have a cup of coffee. I might go to the, the library that I'd come back. And it, it was a very relaxing time. And um, one of the things I'm saying here in the slide is there were many places to write within India or New York State. And what I mean by that is sometimes people have it, you might have it in your heart that you wanna write about a place and there is an impression that there's someone beat you to it, right? Like I've heard somebody say to me, oh, I, I wanna write a novel set in 1920s Chennai, but you're already writing about 1920s um, Bombay. And you know, my answer to that is that look how many books are set in New York. It's old thinking to believe that readers are so limited that there can only be one book published that's one series published that's set in India. Well, certainly now we know that's not true at all. It's just coming out all over South Asia or there's only um, one author for, for Minnesota. And I'm gonna focus in on Minnesota in fact, because there are people that might say, oh, well, a, a mystery set in Minnesota, it's going to be about Lutherans. It might be a little, you know, bit Cohen brothers. It might be a little bit Northwoods. But, you know, in Minneapolis, there's like this vibrant Laotian community, the Hmong people, and they have, a, there's a whole lot of crime. Um, there is a native population. What is their Minnesota? Um, so, there's just so many different ways to look at that town. There's so many different ways you can have characters and have a story set in a place. Um, Sean Cosby, who you may know about, um, he was repeatedly told by um, prospective publishers and agents that if he was gonna write a mystery about a black man, it had to be in a big urban center. And he's a Southern man. He wanted to write about what it was like to be in the countryside of Virginia. And that's the world he knows. And that's a black world too. That's not just a world of white people. So it, it's taken time, but really you shouldn't feel like you can't write because somebody else has done that. I'll get off my soapbox about that. So I started out writing about Calcutta and I wrote about that place because that's where my family roots are. But I wound up writing about Bombay later on. And so this slide inside the culture is what happens is when I'm in India and I'm trying to you know, learn, it, it really helps to be inside the culture. And before I even decided I was gonna be writing a novel, I was having this experience of living in India for about, um, it was a four, more than four months while I was in the process of adopting my baby daughter. That's my grandmother on the left. And so all of a sudden I was living in a traditional multi-generational home. I've also been in an Airbnb, you know, I've had that experience. I think that's a really interesting thing if you're writing a book in another country to take advantage of staying in a place where you can stay with a host. And a lot of these Airbnbs, the host is there. Um, and so that gives me the life of non-restaurant food, non-tourist shopping. Um, sure that you can't, can't use the toilet like for a few hours a day. I mean, that was the situation in that building. Um, but, I, but these were all things that um, made it easier for me to be close to an Indian experience as living like an Indian. And also the advantage of spending time if you've got family members in that place. And this could be a state, this, this could be Nantucket if you're writing mysteries in Nantucket, is you get this intimate knowledge of the city and the region and how things are done um, with, with respect to religion. Like, because there would, there would um, be um, holy people coming through the apartment you know there would be a, like a religious saint coming and you would go to be blessed by the saint and I, I was really nervous about that and um, my sister was with me one nice thing was um, 
on that trip when I was adopting my daughter, my younger sister came with me and she was a great aide. She had better Hindi way. I mean, she actually spoke Hindi. So she was really good. And she could sometimes hear things that I didn't hear that were a little bit troubling, but that also taught me more. And she also could help reassure me. So now I, I travel to India by myself all the time. I have no trouble with it. But that first trip, I was with my sister. And um, another great thing that happened for me when I was in Bengal is I got to spend time with my relatives. And I'm really sorry that my aunt is half out of the picture in this weird little bubble. Um, but, you know, they live a really simple existence. And our family has a very long history in Bengal with the Banerjee family. That's our surname. And one of the things that I learned is, I, you know, later on, I had questions for them, specific questions about the freedom movement and old areas. And they didn't know all the answers to my questions, but they had things they wanted to share with me. Like my cousin wanted to take me on a ride into North Calcutta. And he said, I'll take you, I'll show you where the freedom fighters used to escape. And then, so we went on this ride and we saw, um, he showed me one of our family's old homes that they no longer live in, but where people had lived. And you never know what you're going to get. And people that are generous enough to, to talk to you about something, you know, I, I've found that it's really worth it to be patient, hear what they have to say. They may have something to say that's completely different than what you expect, but it could be really good. And then you absorb things and later on they can be really super useful. And so it took about four years to research and write this book, The Sleeping Dictionary. Um, and I'd say that I had two trips to India. The first one, which was really long, you saw the picture with my daughter. That was before I knew I was going to write a book, but I was starting to absorb things. And then I went back with my daughter when I was 10, when she was 10. And um, that was a really special trip for her. And it was also, I knew what I wanted to do. I had basically written everything I could of this book, The Sleeping Dictionary. And I went to answer, get questions answered that I didn't know. That the, this was the time when I went and found those newspapers that I mentioned earlier, because I wanted a whole lot of details about different things like the Bengal famine. Um, I wanted details about when the Japanese bombed Calcutta. I wanted all those kinds of details. So when I had done all that research at the Ames Library, I was writing during part of it. And um, one of the things that, that I learned that was important to do was even though I had so much research, I couldn't just announce it. I had to weave it in to the story. Um, you know, and that's what, that's my number one tip is that you weave the information in and I'll show you some ways I do it later on in this talk. So I had this experience of this book, which was great. Um, but then I decided to totally jump over and set my next book in Mumbai. That was like an unusual decision for me. Uh, but I wasn't sure that I wanted to write a sequel to The Sleeping Dictionary. I wasn't sure there was a market for it. And also, even though I had a great arc planned out with like a multi-generational series with each book would be narrated by the woman's daughter, the protagonist's daughter, and the, each, each one would have a daughter and each one would become an eventual narrator. I still love that idea. I, I just felt like that the second one was gonna be really dark. Um, and I just didn't wanna go there. I wanted to do something bright. I wanted to do something joyful. And um, I had an opportunity to write a proposal for a new mystery series that was set in India. And I knew from my research on the sleeping dictionary that women lawyers were alive and well and working in early 20th century India. And I, I got the idea that a woman protagonist lawyer would be someone who would have legs to go through a series. And fortunately, um, or I don't know if I would say it's fortunate or not, what I learned is that the women that went to work in professional careers and that their families said it was okay with them, 
they were not largely in Calcutta. They were more in Bombay, now known as Mumbai. And I was very fortunate that I have family members there too. Um, my parents are remarried and my stepfather's family is from Mumbai and they're all still there. So I have that similar wonderful insider assistance there. And then the thing is that I learned about these early women lawyers is that more likely than not their um, religious background was Parsi. I don't know if you've heard of, if everyone's heard of Parsis because it's a very, very small religious community, minuscule. Um, they are members of the Zoroastrian faith and the Zoroastrian faith is a very old faith um, that predates Judaism and Christianity and it, it originated in Persia. And there were a couple of time periods where after, after Islam, uh, came to Persia, the Zoroastrians felt persecuted. And so they had a couple of different immigration waves and the place that they were immigrating was India. So even though there's small numbers, the largest number of Zoroastrians in the world is there. And so I had to learn about Zoroastrians because I knew my lady lawyer had to be a Zoroastrian based on the reality of the faith of the early women lawyers. And at that point, I didn't have any Parsi friends in the United States or India. Um, so what the way I found my way into the world is I saw a couple of really high quality blogs that were about Parsi culture, one called Parsi Cover and one called Bavi Bride. And one was about food and one was about Parsi culture in general. And so I wrote respectful letters to the people in charge of the blogs and I told them I was trying to learn and they immediately said come see me in India go see my sister in India and she's a woman lawyer she's a Parsi woman lawyer she'll tell you everything you need to know so that was a really great um, thing that happened and another great advantage for me in writing about Mumbai is the historic preservation is better. Simply there's there's more money there for it. And a lot of the buildings that are preserved like this beautiful apartment building are lived in by people. And there there's better laws around preservation um, so that those buildings are more likely to stand and there are incredible districts. So it's so much easier for me to describe a scene in 1921 if I can stand on a street that really has buildings from 1921. So here I am eating a paper dosa, which if you've ever had a dosa, it's like the most delicious fermented gigantic crepe and there's potato curry in the middle. It's, it's really delicious. And that was my first day on my trip. And this was back in early 2020. Um, and so I'm eating a wonderful dosa in, in Mumbai, but I can never put that in my Praveen mystery book because it's South Indian food. They wouldn't have had that um, in a restaurant in, at that time. So I have to always be thinking about those things. Another thing that it is, I, I love to stay in this historic club that dates from the 19th century called the Royal Bay Yacht Club. And, you know, there's a family membership. So that's why I'm able to, you know, pay for a room there. And it's cheaper than staying in a regular hotel. It's really wonderful. Um, but, and I would want it to have a scene with, with Praveen in that club. I wanted to have Praveen staying overnight in that club. And then I, I, when I really read the history, I had to actually buy the history of the club and the gift shop. Indians weren't allowed there. Indians weren't be, becoming members until after independence. So I can't use the, I have to use the yacht club in a different way. And also another complication is the streets of the old, you know, the Bruce Street where um, the mystery law firm is, is now called Homi Modi Lane. It's named after an Indian person. It's not named after a, a British colonial anymore. And I wanna use the British colonial names because I wanna be accurate. So I have a special book, which is old street names, new street names. 
So what I was telling you about the diet um, that they didn't, she wouldn't be eating dosa. I don't know if you can see this. This is a menu from, from the Taj Hotel and it dates, it's an early 19th century menu. And it tells you the kinds of things they have, escalope of this and that, Chateaubriand, um, everything is in French because even though it was the world's first luxury hotel owned by an Indian meant for an international audience, the, the Taj Mahal Hotel in Mumbai, um, they ate all this French food. So I had to put all this kind of French food in if she eats at Taj. And how did I find this? Well, hotels and department stores and places like that often have a PR department and you can maybe persuade them to, you know, say, I'd like to have questions answered. You know, I wouldn't put it that way. I'd say, I've got some questions about the history of your magnificent hotel. Do you, could you give me time when I'm coming on this trip? And then, of course, I would always have a link to my um, webpage so they could see that, you know, I, I really wasn't, was a writer. Um, so places like hotels are usually willing. University and government, it, that's a lot more complicated. And for a unit, often the way into a place like a university or a school is to get the name of a professor of, a liter of literature, <laughs> you know, because they're more amenable to mystery authors. Um, I once went into the library at Wilson College, which is this historic missionary college in Mumbai. And fortunately, the, the principal of the college was a professor of literature who taught a course on crime fiction. So I really lucked out and being allowed in because I could have been told, no, I couldn't get into the University of Bombay. Because I couldn't get into the University of Bombay, I decided I'm not even gonna set my story there because I can't get in there. I can't look at this stuff. It's just let them let them be themselves if they they, you know, I can't I can't get in there. I'll go with somebody smaller that is helpful. Um, that you know that was willing to help me and then I also wanted to add that like outreach to the police is very very sensitive um and especially overseas because it could really get you into trouble like are you trying to learn something more are you really here on the right visa you know all kinds of things like that can happen so it took me a it took me years to find a police source in India and what eventually happened is I read an article where about the history of the police, where a so-called police historian was quoted, I found my way to the police historian. And he said, listen, yes, I do still work for the police. Don't call me. I'm not telling you what I am or, you know, this or that, but, you know, you, I'm a police historian and I'll help you every way I can. And he was incredible. And I rode all around Mumbai with him with his, you know, he was actually being driven. Um, you know, he was a kind of a little bit muckety muck of some mysterious ilk. Um, and I got, you know, I saw things that are really um, helpful to me that are continuing in my series. All right. So I want to say create visuals for the readers. So when you're going about your journalism research, your journalism style research, whether it's in the US or in um, abroad, take pictures. Um, and you can also, I couldn't go into this magnificent home. This is a home owned by an ordinary Catholic family. So, in, and look at how the, the, look at the architecture. It seems a little bit Islamic. It seems a little bit, you know, um, Romanesque. It's like the most incredible building. I can't go in there but I can read old novels to understand how people use rooms in their house. I can also read architectural books. Like I just went and sent away for a book called The History of the Indian Bungalow so that I can better understand Indian homes and how they work. And then I always keep weaving the information in rather than reciting. You know, I talk about like she peered through this, the you know, gold plated screen into the other side of the house and saw the patterns of light, um, the sunlight falling on the other side. And then you see a knife covered in blood, you know, so you, you let people enjoy the architecture as they're enjoying the story. 
And another great asset, um, especially if you're a shy person and you don't really want to always be going up and asking people for things, a lot of it you can get from museums. And there are um, decorative arts museums are really great. Um, like the best museums for me, like the, the, these are little figurines of, it says Parsi couple. And this was, these were made in like the probably late 19th century when this, um, there was a special um, handicrafts college established by a Parsi philanthropist. And so all this work went into this beautiful decorative arts museum. I've gotten a lot um, from the Baltimore Museum of Art. Um, there are other museums that I've gone to. Oh, curators might help you. Can you believe that I wrote to the curator at the Sackler telling her I wanted to learn more about a certain kind of ceramic because uh, actually ceramics of the Middle East because that was a plot point in, in my book, um, I think the Typhoon Lover. And she said, come on down. So um, curators are can be really helpful people. Don't be afraid to write a polite note to a curator or a museum director or museum PR. So this book that I wrote that was set in Mumbai turned out to be the breakout book. And oh my gosh, we're already at 415. I am just seeing that. And I had, so I think it was because of the fictional characters were, were realistic. I think it was because of, I used a lot of old legal records to understand the law. And I think that I managed to be respectful towards religious and regional communities. And there was no holds barred on the architecture, clothing and food. So I'm happy in this genre, super happy. Um, and I think that I think I'm going to stop here because I think that I think that I've, I'm looking at my time and it says it's four it's 415. Uh, so Jada, you have until let's see, is it 415 really? Is it? Is it 415? Is my watch wrong? I think it must be wrong. You should be at three, it's 322. It's 322 right now, and you go till 345. Oh, oh, great. Okay, great. Okay. All right. I'm getting back to my share screen. My, oh, so much for the reality of a real watch. Okay. I'm going to hit this Microsoft PowerPoint and hopefully it'll come back. I'm sorry, guys. Okay. So, Okay, so what I so we're going to go a little bit more now that I know I have more time. And I'm going to look at my watch. Um, so we were talking about that this being a breakout book, and what are the things that I do differently that I've learned since um, I've started, you know, all these years of mystery writing. And one of the things when that's that's a challenge is with, with when you're writing a book set in a foreign country. Um, the editor says, you've got to explain every single thing. So like one of the, the, the dumbest things that I had going in my earlier books is like, if I use the word kimono, people would say like, well, it's a kimono robe. So you would have like kimono robe. And, you know, I don't do that anymore. I, I typically have a glossary of terms in the back of the book. And that is something that the publisher Soho Press likes. Um, I think that I did that with you, some of my other books too. I think it's in the Sleeping Dictionary. There's a glossary rest. So that's something that you might want to do to sort of avoid interrupting the flow. But you can also do things where you explain to others. Like here's an example from um, The Widows of Malabar Hill where I have a, in conversation, I wanna tell you more about the scene or why a road is called something because I really like the fact that this road is called the queen's necklace, um, but I don't, but that's also an ethnocentric term and it's not like something that Perveen would be saying all the time. So I have this conversation with her English friend, Alice Hobson Jones. Where are we exactly? Alice asked as the harbor receded. Kennedy Seaface. But this stretch of curving road along the water is informally called the Queen's Necklace 
because of the way it looks when the street lights shine at night, Praveen said. Along the Chow Chow Chowputty beachside, you'll see every sort of person coming out to eat the breeze, as one says in Hindi. So I love that expression, to eat the breeze. And if this novel had been written in Hindi, they would have just said, we're going out to eat the breeze and there would be no other explanation and everybody would know what it meant. Um, but I'm writing for an international audience. So I'm having Praveen do that explanation. And I'm also pointing out that she knows she's explaining it to a foreigner. So that's like one of the, one of the things that I do in my writing, which kind of includes everybody in understanding something. It gives them insider knowledge, but it isn't like lecturing. The last thing I want to do is that encyclopedia entry where you just recite facts about um, a place. So that, that was one of the tips. And so now I'm going on to the pulling it all together um, because all research trips do come to an end. When I was writing about Japan, you know, I would go there and I would, after I had moved back to the United States, after um, Tony was no longer in the military, I had these short trips and I would come back. And so I had to stay connected. I had to keep learning because I was at a disadvantage living in the US. So I stayed part of organizations. I, meant, I mentioned that a little bit. I was a host parent. Um, if you have access, like if you live near um, a university or college, chances are there's an international student's office and they're, they look for these people who are willing to, you know, be, a, a, be like a friendly presence to students. So I had a couple of graduate students from Japan that would, they would come, you know, they, they came and they had a meal with us when they arrived you know, we'd a, a arrive, you know, invite them over occasionally. Maybe somebody stayed with us for a few days during a holiday, but that's an incredible way to build a connection with somebody in a culture. And there again is potentially a place where you could have a sensitivity reader if your issue was an overseas issue. You know, it, obviously this wouldn't apply if you don't have an overseas things. So um, I did that kind of thing. I always maintain very um, long lasting relationships with the people who help me, who answer questions. So I mail a book, I mail a signed book to the person in whether they're in the US or overseas, even if it costs me a lot of money to mail it because I want them to know and, you know, and I acknowledge them if they're okay with being acknowledged in the, um, you know, in the acknowledgements, not everybody is like, especially a government person might not want to be acknowledged, but, you know, ask about it. Um, I know that in India, people really love to use WhatsApp. So I sometimes send WhatsApp greetings. Like during the pandemic, I reached out to all my sources in India and asked them how they were doing and told them I was worried about them. And, um, you know, so I maintain a relationship. It never really goes dead. So it's never just that oh, all of a sudden she comes and she wants something. It's like, we really, we, you know, we know each other now. Um, I continue reading newspapers and literature that are available on the web from India. And that really, that I, I learned a lot of really interesting things and whether it's movie gossip or anything, you know, I learn all kinds of things going on there. And occasionally I, that, that's how I might find an article about the history of the police and find my police historian who's been so helpful. I also try to watch films um, on Netflix and Amazon and other sites that relate to my area. Now I'm careful, I've, there are certain people I'd love to be reading, but I can't be reading. For example, Abir Mukherjee. Abir Mukherjee writes about 1921 Calcutta. He is awesome. I read his first book. I highly recommend his books. 
Um, but when I was reading the first book, I realized, oh gosh, I'm doing something similar in my book. And then we had this horrible, I consider this a horrible coincidence that our second books are both about crimes with royal, royal um, kingdoms, or they, I guess they call them princely states. We, we just independently did that. We didn't discuss it. But I realized that a reader might think that one of us is deriving from the other. So, and that, that kind of a fear, you know, say I've got a book in progress and all of a sudden I realize that a beer has just published something and it's about a princely state. Um, I, that's just like too much to handle. Like then I would feel I might change, it might impact my creative freedom. So I'm careful not to read something that is so, another mystery novel set in India, set in the past that I don't do. I read Nev March's book. I blurbed her book. I was glad that it was set in the 1890s. So it wasn't quite as close, um, but we certainly do have a lot of overlap. So that's like a very tricky area. So I recommend the reading that you do read about that culture, but the more you can do um, that's nonfiction, the better. The more um, mystery you can read that's like all kind of mystery, the better. And then also, if you are a historical novelist, reading novels that were published during the time frame that you're interested in are a great way to get a feeling for the voice that you might want to use, um, that you might want to pay respect to the way that people spoke, because obviously you're not using 2021 slang, but you're going to pick up a lot if you read history fiction that was written at that time. And then of course, spending time with people in the US who share the same interest as you is really wonderful. Like, um, you know, they're just people that are historians, people that love a particular, they're, they're just are people who love Bombay and that have had all these experiences in Bombay. And some of them are actually, they're not Indian but they've, they've been there and they've been there a long time ago and there's a lot of value um, to, to talking with them. So my series is continuing. I really don't know when I'm gonna stop it because I'm enjoying it so much, which is a great thing. And I, I also believe that the more you write about one particular location or time, the less work you have to do um, you have a, you just have a background. You remember things like at this point now, I know what the situation was with telephones and electricity in 1921 Bombay. If I were to switch to another city, they might not have either of those things. So I'd, I'd have to like do all that research again. So sort of the more you build, the better. You can take road trips like my book, um, the Satapur Moonstone, which was the second book in the Purveen series, she does go to a princely kingdom, um, but it's, it's not too far. And I think that mysteries with realistic um, backgrounds are very appealing and they are worth, it's worth the extra time to do them right. You will be rewarded by what people say about the books. And um, so one of the, the cool things about this book is I think I mentioned to you earlier that the Prince of Wales really did visit India in um, not the fall of 1921. And what was incredible, not just, you know, that I know from general historical accounts from things that are written by his historians that there were these riots, but at the same time, the government of Great Britain had like a PR person who chronicled everything he did every hour of the day. They had every, all his remarks because they were prepared remarks. Everything he said in a speech was there. Everything the other, all the other people that were at the party with him or at the speech with him were recorded. So I have all that. This was all recorded and believe it or not, it's, it's accessible on the internet. Um, you know, through the, 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 what's going on with archives being available is really incredible. And so having that framework 
gives me a really great way to tell a story. And I'm probably going to do that more and more. I'm going to look at what was a really interesting thing that happened in 1922 and how can I weave a mystery into that or how I've got to make knowledge of that fact of that this thing was going on. Um, it's, it's a really, it's like a writer's assistant uh, using reality as your, is your, it's like your personal assistant. And then also you want to consider your characters very carefully because they may repeat and you don't go too fast in time because well, for one, it ages your character a whole lot and you may not want to do that. That's the main thing. You may not want to commit your character into, you know, holy wedlock too fast because that sets you up for um, somebody who's going to stop your heroine from going places potentially. Um, and so you consider your characters carefully because they repeat. And so Praveen has some different family members like her. She lives with her father, her mother, her brother, her sister-in-law. Um, and these all are people that have things that can be happening later on that are interesting. She has a nemesis that lives in another city. Um, we, he may reappear in future books. So, you know, now that I'm writing a series for the second time, I've thought about all these things. I think about my characters as these assets that I want them to be able to do things. I don't want to sew things up too neatly in, um, every book because I want to have room to grow in the future. So, and this is my last slide. And it's, so I'm saying time for more questions. And if you have questions for me that come to you later, you could um, email them to me at that email address, sujatamassey at mac.com. And also I have almost every two months, I host a Zoom, gathering where I talk, I, I bring one of my experts that I work with onto the camera and we talk about some aspect. I found that a lot of my readers are now interested in say Parsi food. And so for me to be on Zoom talking with the young Parsi woman who helped me write the wedding menu for um, Perveen in, in the Widows of Malabar Hill, that's, that's interesting. So if you wind up getting my newsletter, you'll always get a link to if there's a Zoom and it might be of interest to you to um, see, some of these, see some of these experts. So thank you for um, sitting through this. You've had a really long day and um, I'm here if you have any questions. So Jada, we have two questions in the chat right now. Uh, one of them is from Barb Goffman, who asks, how do you deal with good guy characters who realistically would have had attitudes in the 1920s that would seem sexist or racist or any kind of ist these days? Wow. So, yes, um, that's a good question, because the, the good guy really wouldn't be saying... Um, you know, the things that we would accept, expect people to say. Um, for example, Perveen's father is a good example because she has, her father is a good guy in that he um, wants her to work and he wants her to um, succeed and be the first woman lawyer in Bombay. But at the same time, he doesn't um, want her to embarrass the firm. So she cannot have, there was an article about her being this first woman lawyer, this groundbreaking lawyer. And he doesn't want her to hang that in the, um, in the waiting room next to his because that sort of points out more how new she is. She just kind of takes on these things and they kind of think of her as an assistant. They don't always realize that she's a lawyer. So that's how I handled that character. Um, so I, I think about um, the humanity in the person, but I also want to make clear what the rules of the time were. Great. Tina asks, did you read contemporary Japanese literature when you wrote the uh, Ray series? And do you have favorites or any who influenced you? Well, I remember there was a book called Kitchen that was by 
Banana Yashimoto that was a really big hit. Um, so I don't, the thing about it is I don't think it did because the only Japanese fiction that I could come across at that time was, um, it was literary fiction. And so it, it was sort of like my own, it was really, I think of the, even though I did read Japanese fiction and I, you know, I read a, a lot of different authors, I, I found, um, I guess what I found is you could see windows into family relationships and um, maybe people not feeling comfortable expressing themselves and holding a lot of things in. I would say I got that from Japanese literature. And I also, that was a feeling that I saw backed up by my interviews with my neighbors and my students and my colleagues is that there was a lot they wanted to express that they were, they were, they felt that they would be negatively labeled if they put forward what they wanted to, to say or what they wanted to do. Great, we still have about four minutes. I don't see any other questions right now in the chat. So if you guys have questions, do type them in real quick here. Uh, Sujata, during the talk, I noticed a couple people commented uh, in addition to all the thank yous that are coming in, because you're getting a whole bunch of thank yeah, yous. Yeah, I see that. Now I'm seeing the chat. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, there were some questions, well, some comments earlier about one person mentioned traveling the same way that people do, for instance, taking the train. And another person had mentioned uh, criminal justice uh, professors being useful sources. So I was wondering if you wanted to comment on either of those two uh, as sources of info. Okay. Well, I've criminal justice prof uh, professor is a great idea. And that's Frankie, right? So yes, it was. <laughs> we have somebody here. Um, the law that I'm concerned with is historic law. It's like, it's British common law, it's Muslim law, it's Parsi law, um, and Hindu law. So where I get my law questions answered is with a a lawyer who is a professor of law at the University of Wisconsin who wrote the definitive book on the history of law in colonial India. And I'm, I, I bought her book, I read it, and I'm so grateful that, I mean, if I can email with her, we've met in person. So that's one of my experts. I occasionally talk to lawyers in the United States if it's a very simple question. Um, but I try most of the time to talk to lawyers in India. Um, and I'm really, the lawyers in India who are helping me are um, women lawyers. So uh, that's kind of interesting. Like I have a couple of Parsi women lawyers that I can regularly um, meet with when I'm in India and email with. And I blogged with one of them recently that she, I asked her some questions on my um column like I do a little blog column for a group called murder is everywhere um, with some other crime writers so that was the question about the criminal um, asking for help that way was there another part to that question that I didn't answer uh, someone had mentioned traveling the same way that the people in the country do for instance traveling by train and I was wondering if you wanted to comment on oh, that. I had some hard times traveling by train with the train breaking down and um, needing to, needing to go to the bathroom and, oh, it was awful. Um, so train travel in India, um, it, it can be wonderful. Um, it can be hard. It's, it's not my favorite way to travel. Um, my, the, the way that works for me is, um, is by car with a driver that I've paid that, um, knows the area and that is very calm and safe and that I have a really good communication with. Um, because you can get into situations, say you're driving in a bazaar where there's like, you know, a hundred people around your vehicle. And if he makes one false move and one person, you, they could be injured very badly. Like you need a very calm driver. And some of like the, I've, I've also been in rickshaws and um, all those kinds of things. And and sometimes it can be, um, th that driver can be dangerous in terms of the safety of others and 
also you can be a little bit more vulnerable. So I think about all those things and usually I, I consider hiring a driver for my time in that country as important. Now, when I was in Japan, I did everything by train because it was not the same kind of issue about you weren't having trains break down. Um, things were really fast. And that was sort of the way the culture was built. And also my character in Japan was traveling by train all the time. So it's like two different methods for two different countries. Right, so Jana, we're about to head into break, but there was one more question if we could just touch on it. And that is, uh, we have a question, what was the reference to murder is everywhere? Oh yeah, okay. So there's a um, murder is everywhere dot blogspot dot net. So this is a group blog where every day a different crime writer who writes fiction that's based outside of the US um, post something. And they aren't just posting about their own work. They're often posting about the country in which they live or um, you know, for example, um, there could be somebody, um, Quay Corte is one of the writers, you know, the Edgar nominated Quay Corte. And he, he writes about Ghana and he lives in California. And so he may do something about Ghana. He may do something about the food of Ghana one week, but the next week it might be about his life as a, you know, in LA and what they're doing, something relating to COVID or, um, so it's it's sort of like about our lives and about um, the, the places that we write about. Great, thank you so much, Sujata. I, I, I'm sure, as you said, you saw in the comments, we're getting tons of people saying thank you and how interesting this was. Uh, yeah, and you guys are, I mean, this is incredible. I hope that people are able to move around a little while they're listening to this, because if you've been on since this morning, it's a long day. And I know there's another one this afternoon and then there's the cocktail party. Right, so everyone remember, we're gonna go into our break now. It's a great time to stretch at four o'clock Eastern time. Our next masterclass will start with Allison Galen. So um, thank you everyone. Make sure you come back in a couple minutes. You don't wanna miss that. <laughs>